All right. Another launch week in the books. Launch week six has officially uh, closed or officially launched and uh, excited to do a wrap up call with both of you. Uh, for those who are new, uh, I'm Bob Tordella, uh, help manage our sales and partnerships at Turbot. And with me, we have Nathan. Hey, I'm Nathan Wallace, founder and CEO here at Turbot. And John. Hey, I'm John Smith. I'm a product architect here at Turbot. All right. Similar style to what we've done in the past. Uh, we'll just go through launch week. We'll talk about uh, each launch and the new features and capabilities across our suite of products. Um, and we'll start with Monday. So Monday was all about Turbot guardrails. Uh, we have a huge heap of features that came out. Uh, and some of the theme there was around making Turbot guardrails easier, as well as making it more efficient, uh, along with some new ServiceNow uh, features that we introduced. To start with one of those topics, we'll talk about the new Turbot guides that were published recently. And I know Nathan, uh, you were working with the, the customer service team and, and we were looking at building a suite of new uh, documentation to make life easier for our day-to-day -day users, whether they're uh, guardrails enterprise admins or they're users of the system. If you can just walk us through, you know, what are these new guides? Why did we come out with them? And what are some of the themes that we introduced for it? Guardrails has like a lot of optionality, a lot of power. It's an enterprise level tool, right? So to be able to run that efficiently, work with that well, you need real information on the steps, the cases and how things can go. And that's for our customers who use it directly, maybe in an enterprise setup where they're running it in their own Amazon accounts. It's also for our integration partners when they're trying to work out how to run it for other people or manage it. And it's for ourselves as we provide support, et cetera, to those teams. We wanted to be able to do that more. So we made all the docs open, um, you know, they're on GitHub so we can get contributions, work with that, et cetera. And then we really wanted to just make it uh, easier to step through, you know, easier to work with and more reliable and publish a ton of guides, but I've worked really hard on screenshots, standard formats for all of that. So you can really step through that sequence. We like our docs across all of our pipes, tools, and guardrails in sort of this sort of learn by doing style or teach by doing so a small bit of context followed by a screenshot or a block of code or something so they're very easy to follow and design in that way so we went through built them out made a huge difference for us operationally happy to share those with everyone and you know we'll be looking to really build on this at this point and make that more and more routine right and thinking about those as assets that we can build on the other big one in there is of course the getting started guide for aws so you know for people who are really getting going with guardrails it steps you through soup to nuts you know from the time you're setting up that first account importing stuff discovering and setting policies doing exceptions beautiful sort of really you know guide you can work through to see, see and understand guardrails all, all the way through so very excited to have those out and we'll keep working to build out more of that. And that's a good focus for the team now. Yeah. And one of the other outcomes of that was actually getting those docs public so mm -hmm. that not only us can, can build them and contribute, but right. also our end users. Um, yeah. and so that that's huge for us, definitely on our open source projects, we get contributions for our docs all the time, which is a huge help uh, for us. And we're looking forward to our guardrail users to do the same. I'm also excited people like you, Bob, can like, you know, instead of answering a question in an email, can now draft yourself a guide, chuck it out there on GitHub with a pull request, and at worst, yep. send the pull request to someone early while we get we do a refinement to get it published. So I'm excited to change up that process for sure. We're uh, bringing down the barriers of uh, documentation, so that's good. Um, <laughs> out of the DMs and into public, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's around just trying to make guardrails easier for all. We also worked on a number of different things to make it more efficient from a performance standpoint and a cost optimization. Why don't you walk us through what some of those things are uh, that users are benefiting from today? A lot of work in the core engine there to keep making things better. And they're as simple as you know, support for Postgres 16. So testing that out, validating that, making sure that's working, sure, ensuring there's a clean upgrade cycle to that. We did a lot of work to move to be able to use ARM or Graviton instances, which you know just has an immediate cost reduction for people, and you know, including ourselves, running at you know 20, 30% sort of range. So we had to update all our Lambda functions for that, all our use of containers, et cetera. And that has a flow on effect through the tooling and stuff you're using. So, you know, looks simple, but it makes a big difference and it was a lot of work. We rethought a lot of the way we do caching in Redis and between the database made that way more efficient. So we could really reduce our elastic cache costs and uh, reduce the churn in our 
cash as well. So just better, more efficient, right? performs better and way cheaper for people to run. We were able to halve um, most of our instances, which was used to huge win for us. We also found that, you know, as we've been, you, people have been using this for a long time, they end up with a lot of retention for activity of stuff they've been doing, just, you know, controls coming or going or versions of resources as they change tags. So we brought in new controls to just let you get rid of that noise once you don't need it anymore. We think generally you need a lot of information last 90 days and you can choose to get rid of other parts. We'll keep when the resource was created, but clean up some of the history, which just again, collapsing the database size down, makes it more and more efficient for people. We upgraded our node instances and another one you know, in there that I'm really excited about was we came up with a repeatable process that we use actually for pipes and for guardrails to do our Postgres upgrades with, you know, basically zero downtime. So using logical replication for that, you know, be able to move that through. And that lets us actually reclaim space out of the database, which is a big yeah. win, um, you know, when things have been going up and down and you do those churn, so sort of um, retention improvements. But it also means we can do database upgrades now very much more smoothly. We can basically move the database whenever we want at this point. And that was a big win for us as well. So. Just a huge amount of infrastructure work behind the scenes there. You know, for context, for those who might not be familiar, uh, Turbot Guardrails has two different distributions. One is Guardrails Cloud, which we host in a SaaS uh, for all of our customers. And then we also have a self-hosted option called Turbot yes. Guardrails Enterprise. We're on the hook to making it more efficient and cost-effective uh, and that, you know, for our SaaS, but then that's in turn then making it better for our self-hosted uh, customers. So it's nice continuous uh, improvement cycle that we have. The best part is for those customers, it's largely just an upgrade through service catalog and it's all. Yeah. So I'm excited to see that, uh, you know, not only for our own operating expenses, but, but also for our customers, uh, lowering their total cost of ownership. So that's great. The, the other big announcement was, uh, introducing yet again, more service now, uh, mm -hmm. discovery and sync features into our integration with service now. So I'll talk about this a bit more because I've been working with a number of customers on leveraging our service now features. So for those who've been following, you know, since. Since the start of Launch Weeks, we actually been introducing a whole new integration scope for ServiceNow. And we originally came out with ways that we we're already discovering all the resources within AWS, Azure, and Google. And then we came out with a new scope for Kubernetes. And for years, our customers have just been asking us, hey, you've got all this on-demand updates of all my resources that are created, updated, and deleted in the cloud. I would love for you to just be able to sync that into ServiceNow. Yeah, you know, we came out with these features, uh, you know, over the course of the last 12 months, uh, and we first introduced ways to bring that data directly into your CMDB tables. So we manage those CMDB tables, we update those records, uh, manage them end to end in a full sync across Amazon, Azure, Google, and Kubernetes. And then we had some enterprise customers that were using us just for the, the sync into tables and records, but then they also wanted to support it through an integration path called import sets. And so that was a major update that we did uh, in new feature set. The next phase of that was our customers saying, hey, that's great that we got all the records in our CMDB, but now we need to be able to relate them and show the associations of how does a Amazon S3 bucket relate to which region, to then which account, to then which business service, right. or what, what data is flowing into that bucket, what's related, like right. what flow log is right. related to that bucket. So relationships are a key point of context that yes. users need. And that's where, you know, the CI relationships that we just uh, announced on automatically managing those relationships is a key part to that cloud discovery uh, suite of services that we have. One of the benefits of that is that, you know, a lot of times our customers are, you know, the problem sets that they had with the native discovery, well, you know, things are out of date, they're slow to update, they're inflexible to change. So in guardrails, all of that's just done through policies. We have out of the box yeah. policies that work immediately, but the ability just to configure that change, whether it's your tables or your CI records, but now right. also your relationships. Right. So it's very easy to then relate custom schemas or tables that you right. have in service now to those resources, all with just a simple YAML configuration. And so it's super powerful, really exciting for the enterprises that got their hands on it already. Light years difference and it's helping them move forward with productionize right. all of this discovery in ServiceNow. Agreed. Um, so I'm, I'm real excited for, for this one, just personally I've been tied to a lot of those pre-sales discussions with folks, so. No, it's a good level up for people. I mean, I think, you know, it's a challenging area, ServiceNow, to your cloud data. 
typically different teams trying to work out how to get together, what's the information we need, who's doing what, a lot of hand coding. Yeah. I mean, what we're finding in our conversation with people is just, this just changes the game for them. Like it reduces massively the amount of transformation work they have to do. It levels up their data accuracy, you know, and it just gives them so much more breadth of coverage than they've had before. It really lets you make your cloud data a first-class citizen service now, as opposed to sort of a, I dare I say, a checkbox, you know, item you've yeah. been making happen in service now. So. Yeah, and, you know, we were able to benefit from some of the work we were doing already on the steam pipe power pipe layer for all of our insight mobs mods that had introduced uh relationship graphs right and so we had all this context of you know which resources relate to which routines or associated or runs on or all the different types of relationship types that was easy context for us to just introduce those features right. i think it was a good win of leveraging what we've done on open source to then bring it forward Close. into uh, to guardrails Sure. Yeah, Monday, awesome new set of guardrail announcements. And then moving on to Tuesday, uh, that was a, a huge announcement was officially shifting towards version one. So 1.0. Uh, 1.0, baby. Yeah, exactly. Uh, for Steampipe, PowerPipe, Flowpipe, as well as all of the, the managed plugins and, and mods from Turbot. And so a huge suite of updates. Uh, I think it was over 116 plugins, 44 mods, and the three CLIs. Massive amount of work to just refresh those, and you know, some of it mainly was just to level up and become, you know, version one. And and John, if you could just talk us through like the importance of version one, or you know, why we now leveled that up collectively as a group, uh, and what does it mean to now be in version one? It's about time for Steampipe, right? <laughs> it's been around for a while. The yeah. uh, shape of it, the edges of where Steampipe existed kind of changed over time, right? So, you know, it started off as being pretty close to kind of what it is now, mostly a query engine. Later on, we added the ability to run controls. And, and there was the whole kind of execution model with, uh, you know, HCL definitions and stuff. And then we added in dashboards. And then later on, we decided we actually we want to abstract that out so that those dashboards and benchmarks could run against any data source. And so we pulled it out into PowerPipe. The original vision kind of when we started building Steampipe was also to be able to allow you to take action. Uh, and we made a decision fairly early on that we didn't think that we wanted to do that via like SQL updates because the problem is that the granularity of these changes aren't really aligned with a column in a table, right? The APIs aren't really written that way. So, you know, we came out with with PowerPipe. At this point, we're pretty confident that that these are the discrete products, right? And they're going to continue to evolve, but their core features are relatively set. To some extent, it was time. The thing is, there's a difference between the 1.0 of a core product like PowerPipe and Flowpipe and Steampipe uh, and things like plugins and mods. In those cases, going to 1.0 is, is important because they start to depend on each other. And once you have dependencies, then the versioning is important from expressing the dependencies <laughs> Uh, in a way that makes it possible for you to build upon them. We still have this kind of idea of versions like left over from the released published package software days where we use it as a marketing thing. But the when you have libraries and mods and plugins and you're trying to build things that compose them together, the semantic meaning is actually more important. And so to me, getting those to 1.0 is a bigger deal. Now it's hard to it's hard to make a mod or a plugin 1.0 when the product that's using it isn't <laughs> yet. As we start to, you know, use pipelines that build on other mods for instance, you know, we we have mods like, you know, thrifty and compliance and stuff like that for flowpipe which are composed using the AWS mods underneath or the Azure mods underneath and there's, you know, kind of this layered composition. Well, knowing that the version dependencies meet the SEMBER constraints is really important at this point. And anyone that's kind of familiar with SEMBER knows that before 1.0, it's not really enforced in, in the same way that it is once you get to 1.0. And so I'm excited about 1.0 from the perspective of you know having products that are released as a GA type of a product but I'm actually more so as an engineer, knowing that we can build upon these and that we can release these things in a way where 
uh, we can pin the versions correctly and, and continue to, to build upon what's already been there. Yeah, we definitely plan to keep evolving them forward. So don't feel like they're going to be stuck at one for years. I, mean, I, I often joke internally, I, I'd rather be at V0, or V56. V1 is like this big emotional step to get there. It's yeah. scary. Are we ready and everything? It's now a lot, Jen. Yeah. They keep going, right? And so, you know, we, we don't, we want to make that predictable for our users. And, but we also want, we'll, we will keep moving forward, right, with things. So, um, you know, excited to keep that moving forward now, let the versions evolve as they need to. Um, you know, by the way, we also spent a lot of time through that Pipes ecosystem on having very strong versioning capabilities and dependency capabilities that are version aware, et cetera. So we're ready for that. There's a lot of power there if you want to use it, if you want to move at your own speed or whatever you can, and pin things, et cetera. It's all, it's all in there. It's exciting to let that move forward now. And it feels good. Yeah have reached that milestone emotionally as well. As yeah, well. I mean, it was also an opportunity to go over things again and make sure that they're ready to go from a product perspective, right? There's a difference between like shipping a version of a library and shipping a product that has documentation around it, that has a good readme that, you know, is, you can find it in the hub. It has the right classifications and the right, you know, and, and I think it was uh, this effort, it was a large effort by a lot of people to get these things to that level of consistency and quality that we want. Every single one of them is better for having gone through that, I think. But I think you're also your point early, John, about we know the shape of these products now. Like this is what they're going to look like. This is what they should look like. Products should have a size, a definition and a shape that you can rely on. That's part of the principles we're going for here with why we have the different pipelines. Now we know that shape, they'll evolve, but they know what they're meant to do in life, right? And now they can keep moving within that and we can build around them uh, for that. And people can build on them with confidence. Is there anything that users should know about before upgrading to it? Like I know one of the big changes in Steampipe was deprecating the mods out. Are there other big- At Removing. That? They were deprecated before. They've been deprecated for yes. some time. In 1.0, we don't support the running of mods from Steampipe. You'll have to, you'll have to use PowerPipe. For, yeah. for that. That was the biggest one, certainly. I'm trying to think what Moving else. to connections from credentials in Flowpipe yes, is probably that's another right. one. And so you know, we've standardized on the model of connection across Steampipe, PowerPipe, Flowpipe at this point. So we've got common language on that throughout them. So that was you know probably the other one. But otherwise, no, you should generally just be able to keep upgrading the way you always have and you won't feel any real impact. Yeah, the database argument, it was the with final one in PowerPipe. So moving away from a single argument for a database built into the command line to being able to pass it as a variable so that you can change your default based on, you know, what your mod expects. So that, that's another change as well. I think these are captured pretty well in the change logs uh, and the documentation is up to date where things have been deprecated. They're generally called out in the docs. Yeah, every changelog has a breaking changes section for all the plugins, all the CLIs, et cetera. It's there if you need to know. The next day uh, was about Flowpipe. So there's a couple of announcements about Flowpipe, but to get started, uh, this was a uh, now continuing forward in our detect and correct uh, mods. So in prior launch weeks, we released detect and correct uh, themed mods for uh, Thrifty. So uh, cost controls or FinOps controls also tagging and labeling. And now this launch week, we introduced compliance detect and correct, as well as a different experience for using that interactive wizard in your terminal uh, for working through those. Uh, so John, if you wanted to talk us through, you know, what is the AWS compliance mod for Flowpipe? What's that user experience like with the interactive wizard? Sure. The compliance mod allows you to fix things that are broke. It's based around, currently around CIS. So essentially, it follows the same structure as CIS does in evaluating. And generally the remediation steps are the things recommended in the CIS documentation. That Flowpipe mod is uh, interesting because it also relies on having Steampipe as a data source in order to do the querying and to get your configuration uh, information. And then it uses the other AWS module in Flowpipe to run right. commands to fix the things. What we discovered when we built it was that to make it feel like CIS, it needs to kind of be interactive in a more sequential yes. manner. When you write Flowpipe pipelines, all the steps run in parallel unless they have a dependency. Yep. And technically, all of the CIS stuff 
doesn't really have dependencies on each other. So a given a given control objective will have dependencies because it needs to query and find out the thing before it can fix the thing. And it will prompt for uh, if you want to approve. So all that has to happen sequentially for a given control. But you could run all of these controls. And I don't, there's, I don't know, probably hundreds. I don't know how many there are totally. You, they all technically could run in parallel. Uh, but from a user experience, getting all of those requests and having to approve them all in like one lump sum is super confusing. Making them appear one at a time, but not in any order is also confusing. So we we wanted a way to to be able to interact kind of in a in a more consistent way. The other thing was the default in Flowpipe for sending messages and inputs previously was what we called uh, the HTTP integration, which just creates a a web server and it has a endpoint for the particular input request that you need to approve. And when you were running it interactively, you'd see a URL that you could then go to to approve the thing. Now, you, of course, could route it using the, the notifiers and the other integrations to, to talk to Slack or, or whatever. But the default first experience for when you're running a mod is typically to use the default. So you just see it on the console. And what we realized is we need a better interaction with the console the, because the console is a first experience and having a good, easy first experience is critical. It's been one of our design principles from day one since we started on Steampipe was that you should be able to just pick it up and use it. And it was hard to use this mod that way. And so we decided to add in a new default terminal experience. So when you run Flowpipe in client mode, it has two modes. There's a server mode and a client mode. So if you do Flowpipe server start, it starts a server and that's meant to be able to run a whole bunch of pipelines interactively, you know, to do them automatically, to, you know, to basically function as a server. So your triggers would run, if right. you have scheduled triggers, they only get loaded in server mode and all that stuff runs. And it can still reach out and talk to you through Slack or whatever, but it doesn't talk to you through the terminal because it's a server, right? Client mode was conceived to just be like for dev test. So before you put it on the server, you want to be able to just quickly run your pipeline. And we don't want all the overhead of running the, the server. so. You could just go to any directory in the mod, pipeline list, pipeline run without the overhead of running the server. What we added is when you're running in client mode, inputs will interact with the terminal. So when we redid the compliance mod to interact with the terminal, these inputs now ask you formatted questions in the terminal directly. Instead of giving you a link that says, hey, there's an input request, go to this web page, open up your browser and click approve. It asks you the question and waits for a response. It will only ask you for one at a time. So if you don't order them and 10 of them run at once, it will still only ask you one question at a time and it'll choose the order. You can also, of course, use the dependencies that depends on in the HCL to force an order. And so the compliance mod as, as it is now is basically a CIS in order execution against your environment that will ask you the questions as you go through. Starting with section one, number you know one dot one. This is the thing. If it has a recommendation, it'll find the resources and it'll prompt you. Do you want to take the remediation action? Yes or no. After you do it, it will respond, go off and do its thing, ask you the next question. And so now, when you run that in the terminal, it's an ordered, easy to understand flow that follows CIS directly. It, you know, it's made that first experience really easy. So if you're already running Steampipe and you've already set up your configurations, you can install this mod and it'll basically, you know, it, it's going to use your default search path essentially. So if you have an aggregator with all your accounts in it, you have to set up a credential import in Flowpipe to get those Steampipe creds, which is like three lines. And then you can just run it and it'll start going through your whole environment and and basically it's a wizard that runs in your terminal to help you comply with the with CIS standard. That's what I'm so excited about. I mean, there's tools out there for sitting in your terminal, including ours, that basically will, you know, assess your environment and check it and run a CIS test or other things. I'm not aware of one uh, that basically will instead of assessing it, actually just step you through literally the assessment with one click remediations through the whole thing. So start up, we want to run it against one of your accounts or an individual who wants to just keep your environment safe, just step through this wizard and you fix them all with one click and away you go, right? 
but in that flow pipe way, it's built as a series of layers. So that's the CIS bond that's really optimized for that terminal experience running in order. It uses the compliance mod, which actually has the base level controls for each one of those steps, which you can set up with automation, you know, query triggering and all that sort of stuff. So literally you can set it up to say, I never want to have a bucket without public access, or I never want to have, you know, whatever rule you choose from CIS here and just say, run that in server mode, watch that, fix it automatically, or run that in server mode. Whenever you see it, send me a Slack message and I'll one click choose what to do about it, right? And that's building on a layer of the AWS library mod, which does all the basic functions. So the whole thing, you can tap into it at any layer you'd like to be able to do all sorts of automation, AWS in this case, but of course that applies everywhere. So really strong first experience as a terminal, simple running your terminal away you go, but that's just the start. You can level that up to your whole org through the other, you know, phases of it. It's exciting. That's why we started with Thrifty and stuff. Cause when you're going to make a decision about what to change, you need a lot of information. We worked really hard to give you the right messages. So you've got enough context to decide. Sorry, John, I cut you off. No, I was going to say that, that, you know, it's a good point. The, you can run it in server mode. You can run it in, in client mode. Essentially it's using the same components yeah. uh, and they're just exposed in a different way. So you know, if you want to run it interactively on your client and step through things one at a time, super easy to do that. You can also style it into pipes, set up query triggers, and to, to Nathan's point, automatically route the request right. to those through through Slack uh, and take those remediation and actions, you know, on, on a scheduled basis or as things change. The other thing I enjoy about Flowpipe with these things is that ultimately when it's taking the action down low, it's running the AWS CLI. So when you actually go through the code and you know, look at the mod of how it's calling to take that action, you can see the CLI command that it's running right there. So they're really easy to add new ones. It's easy to understand. It's just all magically wrapped up with you, uh, wrapped up for you in layers of that sort of flow in the containers and stuff that Flowpipe's so. It's a great example of what you can do too, right? I mean, the point of Flowpipe is not it's just to have a tool where we just release a bunch of things that you can use that is a side effect it, it's real power is that you can build your own pipelines using those other mods and building upon those libraries and if you have your own rules of the, the things that are most important to you uh -huh. you can build on those same mods in the same way you can use it as an example uh it's you know super powerful but it's also really easy to do the same right. thing for, for your own mods yeah, I like the the fact that you know the, the Amazon compliance mod comes with like eighty plus uh, pipelines that you can use, like you know basically fix your buckets, you know uh, do manage IMDS on your EC2 instances, all of that's there out of the box. But yes, yeah, so you can write your own controls, and then on the other sense, you have the AWS CIS, which gives you a model to form a hierarchy of dependencies in a right. way. So you could build your own custom framework, your own benchmark, or the NIST one or the, you know, C, uh, the next CIS or HIPAA, right. but these batteries included are so critical. I mean, just yeah. the CIS mod itself, I mean, already includes version four, which yeah. just was released the uh, CIS version four, just, you know, weeks ago or days ago, whatever it was. So it's like, you know, the, the currency of what we were able to do, get it out there in the hands, it's like a right. huge level up. And then yep. from there, just to iterate is, is so important for the community. Well, even like the detect and correct part of that, we call them detect and correct pipelines, but there's a special, there's a mod called yeah. a library mod called detect and correct, whose job in life is to basically step through with very simple parameters, a multi-step approval, if that's what you want it to do or automation or whatever. And it just frames the whole thing. So we're using that as the heart of all of ours. So if you want to build your own pipeline, detect whatever steps you want to do, run whatever containers you want to do, et cetera, but just wrap it in a multi-step approval in like Slack or email or both or whatever you want. It's like trivial at this point with Flowpipe and other tools like that's to me, the heart of workflow for DevOps, right? Mm -hmm. Workflow for DevOps is about, I need to run scripts in containers or do these things with credentials and I need approvals because I can't just do it all myself. If I could do it all myself, I'd just click around and do it. But this really lets you set that up and route that around a team. And that's, you know, that's what makes Flowpipe so unique and powerful for this use case, I think. An interesting thing about, you know, these kinds of things is sometimes they're actually too much. We always talk about extending things and adding things, but sometimes if you are in an organization where your user right, uh, right. is not you, what you actually want to do is remove things. 
yeah. and restrict them and only see the things that you want to do. And, uh, you know, the, the mod, the CIS mod is great, but it's really big and it's got a lot of stuff in it. And maybe you don't really need all of that stuff. Well, you can build on the same stuff because basically the CIS mod is a facade in front of other mods. And it's simple to just pick it up and build your own and strip it down to just the stuff that you want to do. So we always talk about it extending things, but, but restricting things is actually just as important to the user experience. Well, that's actually what Bob ends up doing all the time. When you say it's simple to use, even even Bob can do it. You know, I'm joking around. It's very common. But, but yeah. basically, you're doing that all the time, right, with customers, whether it's PowerPipe or FlowPipe or whatever. You're largely building custom mods to just do the few things they want. Yeah, the remix, the reuse, you know, the, the way that we kind of talk about it when traditionally with Steampipe, but with PowerPipe and now with FlowPipe, it's just so powerful where, you know, using the examples, someone like myself, who's not an educated developer, uh, you know, one of the, could just compile things and copy and paste well, is, you know, this ability to, to remix those things and make it your own. But yeah, simplification is key. And that's, uh, you see a lot of use cases where it's like, I just want a, a, an encryption control set, you know, I don't care about the other stuff. And it's like, they just whittle that down to just a very specific use case. That flow pipe experience has just been right in your terminal. It's mainly for yourself or to extend that to your team through notifiers. Uh, but with the big announcement on Thursday was that now flow pipe is officially elevated to be part of Turbot pipes. Yep. So already Turbot pipes include steam pipe, and power pipe. Yeah. And now, uh, as of, uh, as of this week, is also flow flow pipes mm -hmm. and pipes. Uh, so maybe we'll just first start because you know tongue in cheek way of explaining it on our blog post. We said you know pipes assemble, and right. we're talking about steam pipe, power pipe, and flow pipe coming together. So if Nathan, you want to just talk us through like that that journey of that coming together. What is what is really our strategy there on mm -hmm. having one cohesive strategy and pipes across our open source projects? Uh, and then we could talk about the what what does flow pipe and pipes look like. We believe that there are fundamental sets of tools that develop uh, DevOps teams, security teams, cloud operations teams need to be successful in this environment. And we believe that the best form of those tools will be in their hands, runnable on the terminal, ter on the, in the terminal, explorable, composable, just like the cloud is, right? And so that's effectively what we're building with these pipes tools. They're things you can just try, run, use, et cetera. And then in pipes, what we're doing is providing you with the best experience to combine them, scale them up to your team, share them out, run them continuously on, you know, at larger scale over time. Many people doing many things over time. That's what our goal is with pipes, right, for those. So, you know, what we've been doing is sort of bringing those together. Now with Steampipe, we started there. And then, you know, it was originally Steampunk Cloud, in fact, and then Turbo Pipes. And we had, you know, the dashboards were kind of combined in with it the same way it was in Steampipe, if you recall, before we broke out PowerPipe, right? And Pipes was still a little bit the same. With this release, we've really let those different, you know, um, Pipes components shine on their own. So you'll actually see, you know, uh, when it's ro rolled out to you, which is, you know, coming gradually over the coming days, but basically you'll see the different things, Pipes, Steampipe and Flowpipe are now separate components in that UI, same way they are in Amazon services or in AWS, if you're used to that sort of experience. So you can see each one of them and interact with them. That makes them simpler to understand easy to use and feels more familiar as you come up from the CLI into that world. Pipes is amazing with the GitHub integrations and all that sort of stuff. So you can do custom mods, automatically publish them, all that stuff works, or all of our standard mods are kind of available out of the box for you to use as well. So if you don't want to do the code, that's okay. Just run them. They're all there. We've got plenty of customers who prefer to do it that way. They find it easier than the CLI. But for us, the vision there is to give you access to those pipelines as separate services, which you can then you know, talk to each other. So then we built common pieces above that, same way AWS might have IAM or login. We've got our common components there, like connection management. You, you don't want to set up your Amazon connection five times in pipes for each different service we're using. You want to set it up once and have it reused across them. So that all works now dynamically. When you're using PowerPipe, you don't want to say, oh, where's my Steampipe connection? It should just know where it is. So it does. When you're using Flowpipe, right, to query Thrifty, which happens via Steampipe, so it can go multi-account and all that sort of thing. It should just be able to know where to query it and work. All that works out of the gate. So for us, it was really about giving you access to those pipe tools that you've been using with and enjoying on your desktop 
running them in that you know, SaaS service mode so they can be for many people sharing collaboration, doing many things, scaling hundreds of accounts over time with scheduling and all that sort of stuff. But in a way where it feels still composable, usable, extensible, and something you can build on, right? So many of the other tools in this space are like, here's a big hardwired ball together which is, you know, can be great, like not, not, a, not a bad thing at all, but it's a different philosophy to the problem. It's one you've just got to sit back and enjoy the show and work out how to use it. Maybe it's a bit of an API. Our philosophy is these are tools that you should be able to compose, build on individually, bring together and sit more and more on top of to do more and more interesting things with. And that's what we see teams wanting to do. They want to be able to query, you know, in detail. They want to be able to set their own pipeline running. They want to manage that with code. These are DevOps people. They're used to working in the cloud. They want that same feeling, but for these tools. So that's what we're trying to give. The whole UI experience had changed in pipes as part of this release to be much more focused about these primitive tools, Steam Pipe, Power Pipe, Flow Pipe. For those who just mainly want maybe a hosted experience or a integrated shared experience across it, it's a little bit more intuitive to realize which open source project you're technically interacting with and the features and the problem sets that they're solving. And that mainly came about because now introducing Flowpipe, you know, we already had a concept of pipelines that were behind the scenes kind of operating like scheduling uh, snapshots or scheduled query snapshots uh, in the background. But now that's kind of elevated, Flowpipe is in pipes itself. And so what are what can users expect now once they get Flowpipe in Turbo Pipes? What is it that you know they're gonna be able to do or not do with Flowpipe being in there? you can kind of think of it as a hosted flow pipe server, right? So, you know, we said you can run flow pipe on your terminal and uh, the developer experience locally is really easy. You, you know, you just run a pipeline from a mod directory. When you are trying to manage an organization on an ongoing basis, like the, the pipelines that you're running, you don't want to have some guy sitting there clicking buttons all the time, right? You, you want to respond when things happen. You want to regularly review the environment uh, and you want to interact via the preferred communication channels when right. you want to interact with them. And that means running a server, as we said. And when you run Flowpipe server, one of the key things that you can do in a pipeline, one of the key features I believe that that's a differentiator for Flowpipe is the input steps, right? The ability to send a request and ask for input from somebody, ask for a response or an approval or more information and, and do it in a way where you can send it over various different mechanisms. You, If you want it over Slack, you can do it over Slack. If you want it via Teams, you can do it over Teams. If you right. want email, God love you, send your email. Cool. The problem in you know running that on your, on your client is that you need public endpoints to respond to for all of this stuff. So. Right. No, you have to set up a server and it has to have a public endpoint. So you you got to, you know, reverse proxy or ngrok and, you know, they're, they're just, there's a lot to it. it Flowpipe and pipes, it's just there for you to use. Those endpoints are kind of taken care of by us, you know. Right. Uh, even things like we added a, a Slack integration. If you've set up the Slack integration in Flowpipe, you know, it's, it's pretty easy on the Flowpipe side. But on the Slack side, you also have to set up a Slack app. And you got to put in the right request URL. There's some back and forth. You know, if you're doing it on your local machine, then every time you get a new, you know, address, you have to redo it on the Slack side to get the response URL. We have a Slack app that basically click a couple buttons to talk to your Slack instance on a on a given default channel, and then of course you can change the the channel on uh, that you send the stuff to on a on a per uh, pipeline or per uh, notifier basis. So basically, you can think of it as a easy to use interface to run a full flow pipe server. Just like with power pipe, you can go in the console and install mods right from the console. And once they're there, just like in power pipe, your dashboards appear. Well, their pipelines just show up. You know, the pipelines are available for you to run. If they have query triggers, they'll be listed in the triggers. They're disabled by default. So they won't just run, but you just go over to the page, enable the trigger, change the schedule. You know, if you want to run a given pipeline on a schedule, you can do it right from the interface. Uh, you just go find it in the list, tell it you want to set up a schedule, give it the right information. These are the parameters that I want to use. This is the schedule that I want to run and, and it runs. There's also scalability, right? I mean, you can run more pipelines in parallel on our server than 
than you would likely want to run on your on your laptop. So, you know, I think there's still work to do to extend all of this stuff. Right now, out of the box, it's just a really easy to use, fairly scalable way to run flow pipe pipelines. And, you know, running it as a server makes it real-time interactive with your environment as opposed to user-driven. The stuff I love as well is like, once you've got your mod out there and it's running a flow pipe, you can get push, boop, it's updated. New pipelines running for every time it's, you know, schedule or whatever. Or you can pin it and version it, all that sort of stuff developers like to do. We have all that flexibility, but it's just so easy to just push code and there it is and it's working, right? It's annoying to do that yourself. But even if you are running your own server version, it's like, that's a lot more work to make all those things work, ties it all in. The other part is like, let's say using Flowpipe with, you know, Steampunk, which is how it works for those mods. Like maybe you're just monitoring, looking for those instances, which don't have the you know, IDMS V2 or whatever. Add yourself a new Amazon account, right? You add the connection, boop, Steampipe will automatically put it in the aggregator, Flowpipe's querying Steampipe's aggregator automatically, it finds the new thing and bang, they appear in your next pipeline run. Like it's just seamless for that sort of stuff when you're trying to scale out your org, right? I mean, what John said about the Slack integration, it is easy and it's two clicks, but if you do it tenant level, it's done. Like nobody else in your org ever has to worry about it again. You know, it's just there and available right for you to use. So really easy, reusable components there. Use your pipelines, run them. And now dream is that you're running, loving flow pipe locally, building those things up and then testing your pipeline, running them, all that sort of stuff. It's the same code. You just push it up and it runs in that context. That should be really easy for you. That's going to be a great experience, not only for the individual, but for the team and the org. Yeah, I've been really enjoying that from a power pipe standpoint on being able to build like those custom mods and then deploy them and then be able to share them. So now with Flowpipe, it's going to be a very similar like personal dev experience to then uh, publishing out to the rest of the folks that are consuming it. So exciting for that and, and all the integrations between the connections and the, the identity model that we have. It's great stuff. Yeah, looking forward to uh, more folks. When you, on that. when you think about what you're actually doing, you're writing yourself a mod that maybe runs AWS CLI commands, right? Which are usually in a container. You can run anything you want, it doesn't matter. But basically it's like, you're literally just pushing a mod with that. Did you have to think about setting up containers? Did you have to worry about doing anything about Lambda function deployments or wiring up events or any of that stuff? None of it. Right. None of it. You just write your mod, you can test it local, you push it up, you're done. Like that is so much easier than the alternatives when you're talking about the typical things DevOps people want, which is running commands, maybe doing things in containers, running a function, tying that up with an approval. To do that yourself in a different way, you're setting up web servers and running containers. Like it's like a massive, massive piece of architecture. Here it's you know tens of lines of HCL. And yeah, we mentioned the Slack app. I mean, that was another thing that kind of casually made its way into the, the blog post and the demo. Um, and there's just a heap of other projects or features that we announced, but didn't really right. make it to like the full big announcements per day. And that's where we have right. our, uh, what we call B-sides of launch. Yeah. Slack app was was one of those, um, but we also had a heap of things within guardrails, within pipes. Right. And so why don't we just maybe just cherry pick a few of those uh, and yeah. going back into guardrails, uh, maybe we'll start with like one of the, one of the up, we made a ton of updates and I encourage everyone to look at the, the B-Sides uh, blog post for more details, but uh, we're just picking one of those out was around uh, just something simple as in just making sure that we're up to date with things like the Azure SDK that we use across all of our Turbot mods, which we have hundreds of them. You know, Nathan, if you want to just give some background on, you know, when we need to make a change across hundreds of mods, you know, how do we do that? And then for something like the Azure SDK, what's the benefit of us maintaining that and, and deploying it? Well, anyone who works with Azure knows that they love to change their APIs and their SDKs. So um, they you know, did another round of that. And so you've got to work out how you're going to move forward with that. And so you choose the next version up and you start changing to it. So for us, of course, you know, with so much um, work there, you know, with, we just have to go through the process of updating. So we check that, we work out, we're working the credentials, we do the updates for that. We have a lot of great tooling internally that makes that much easier for us, but it's still a lot of work. And actually the real work's in the testing. How do you make sure this is working as expected across the different environments, across you know, government environments, commercial environments, et cetera, which we cover for very large customers. So, you know, a lot of testing work to make that happen. And ultimately we hope nobody even notices, right? So it's that sort of you know, beautiful, thankless task you're doing behind the scenes, but a necessary one just to stay on top of things. You know, we're 
you know, not in this launch week, not out yet, but we started work on the AWS SDK updates as well, which we also still have to do. So, you know, there's always change to happen in that environment. So that was one of the guardrails. And we did a bunch of other things in the B side. I'll call a couple out. So to me, yeah, PowerPipe GitHub Actions is an awesome thing. So now if you yeah. go to the GitHub Marketplace, search for PowerPipe, you'll find a check action and a setup action. There's already a Steampipe setup one. So if you want to use PowerPipe to do snaps or whatever in GitHub, that is easy. Just go to the marketplace. It's all there. We casually release that one. Um, Flowpipe now lets you run a trigger on demand. That's one of the things we learned doing it. It's like if you set up a trigger, like a query trigger or whatever uh, time period, sometimes you just want to be able to run it when when you want to. And you can now do that with the Flowpipe trigger run command. So that was a good one. Slack app you mentioned. The other one I'm excited about is in pipes. We um, use the GCP service account impersonation using the service token creator role. So you no longer have to set up all the different service accounts and stuff. You can just give us one role and we can import and you know manage that whole org for you really, 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 really easily. So that's you know better temporary credentials, easier for import, easier management for everyone, nice security level up and usability level up um, to bring that feature out. So that was a great one. Fun to talk about, but the, the, those are definitely some key highlights. Yeah. Tons of uh, new plugins uh, for Steampipe. There's new uh, benchmarks uh, for PowerPipe, uh, compliance benchmarks. Uh, yeah, I mean, you name it, there's just tons of things. So yeah, definitely uh, encourage folks to take a look at that. Um, or just follow along in our change logs, which was a, 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 an early uh, launch week announcement of getting all of our change logs together as an RSS feed so people can subscribe uh, to yep. it also. Um, now, uh, kind of close off launch week, I and mean, one of the other events that we were running uh, since the end of September is our annual Hacktoberfest. Been doing Hacktoberfest for uh, a few years now uh, and continuing that forward. Uh, essentially, for us, we're just kind of uh, kind of joining in on the fun that you know DigitalOcean has and, and other open source uh, projects have this time of year. But throughout the entire year, we're accepting contributions, I mean, daily, at minimum from the community messaging us or offering feedback or GitHub issues or committing code. Uh, but this time of year, we just try to kind of group together those announcements and try to encourage more contributions than folks normally do. Uh, but for anyone who does con uh, contribute to us uh, throughout the year, we do offer swag uh, in form of stickers, uh, t-shirts and virtual high fives. But you know, this uh, Hacktoberfest, we're already starting to see a number of contributions from our community. Uh, I know Nathan, you you had some conversations with folks in the community. Uh, there's probably a few that you want to call out, or some that you found interesting. Uh, you know, beyond the the documentation fixes, which are highly encouraged and welcome, and new plugins, new columns, new tables, new. No, we we love the small fixes like that just come all all, all the time. Please please keep giving them they, they're, they're super value. Even if it's just an issue saying, I'd love to have this table or why did you do, not do that? Or a question in the Slack channel, it all informs what we're doing. So it's awesome. Yep. You know, a few things, there was uh, someone found some nice, uh, we weren't handling errors properly in the um, in some S3 tables and stuff in Steampipe. That was a nice catch, good fix that's I think already emerged. So definitely enjoyed that one. Some people have published some new plugins for Cortex and Detectify or a couple I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, Patrick DeCat, you know, with his, um, he's you know, really seems to be scaling out GCP at the moment. So of course he does that with rigor and he's in there. Okay, we need to change this table. We should add more tables so I can query on my project lists and stuff like that. So, you know, that's um, great to have him in that area. Dominic's working on tables for AWS Shield, which is awesome because Shield costs like, I don't know, four grand a month or something to even start. So, you know, we're not going to like just play around with that one though. That would definitely cause our finance team to be chasing our developers if that one popped up on the bill, but just have someone who's already using it say, yeah, you know what, I can build these tables and I can give that back to the community and doing that with real passion through the feedback from our team and the examples and all that stuff, getting it right. So, you know, great to see that one flowing through. Then we also had someone building out um, Helm charts for Steampipe and Powerpipe as well. It's up on GitHub that they're doing, which is great great because you know that defines containers and other things we not in that game we're sort of doing the developer CLI so you know it's f fantastic to see someone grabbing that and running with that and you know putting real effort into that that people can I think pile on and build around which has been fantastic love Hacktoberfest love seeing the flow through blog posts people are doing all that sort of stuff so um, yeah which was which was helpful for uh the community member that was then building the the Kubernetes help chart 
and then yeah. also then extending out the power pipe mod. Uh, yeah, that would be an interesting one. Yeah, someone wrote up they wanted to do more detail on the cost out of Cube, right? And it's quite the the data's a bit non-standard, shall we say? There's it could be numeric, it could be text. So you did some you know Postgres functions and chatted with us about it. Slack how it's Postgres functions sort of normalize that. And then someone else picked that up and sort of read that blog post and started working on how to do the next phase of that. But that's, um, love seeing people collaborating on things like that. It's great. And a great place to do that is in our Slack community. So if you have not joined it, perbot.com slash community slash join. So it's all over the place on our website. Plug in there, that's the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And excited for Hacktoberfest to wrap up and get that swag out the door to, to all those who uh, participated. So with that, uh, that officially ends uh, launch week six. Really excited for the next launch week in the next few months. Uh, I want to thank you, Nathan and John, for talking us through uh, the week and look forward to working with you guys uh, on the next set of features and improvements. No, totally. And big shout out to the team for a massive amount of hard work on another huge set of features. It doesn't come easy bringing all this yeah. stuff together. So, you know, the passion and commitment they bring to it is just, it's inspiring and it's exciting. Uh, I'm always talking about the next one before the end of this one, but, <laughs> but it's great that everyone's in there uh, smashing and finishing those things off. Thanks, Bob. All right. Thank you both.